Yeah, right, there we go. We're recording. Sorry about that. So, yeah, it can increase productivity. Um, you can also improve with dealing with stresses by repeating, by dealing with the same stressor multiple times. If you think um, having a baby, first time, your first child is going to be ridiculously stressful absolutely completely unknown to you um lots of new things and lots of having to having to learn very quickly when it comes to baby number two or three it's it's repeating them same stresses you've developed systems you've developed the ability to um to deal with that stressor better so the stress response or the impact of that stressor isn't as bad um my experience of this when in the army you'd see soldiers deployed on operations the first time they were shot at, this is a massive stressor. Um, you would literally try and dig yourself into the ground, as like hug the ground as low as you could. The further and further you would see lads going into an operation, the better and better they would deal at getting shot at, whereas at some point towards the end of an operation, lads weren't even flinching. They weren't taking cover, they were standing up because they'd repeatedly been exposed to the same stressor. And so their body had learned to deal with that specific stressor every time. There's a lot of big um, business people say that you should expose yourself to some certain levels of stress within, within business, because if you don't, then you're going to get comfortable and you're not going to advance. It's the same with training. If you're related back to training, if you're constantly lifting, the same weight, same reps, same intensity every week, and you're not increasing the stress on your muscles, then you're not improving. You're not going to progress. You're not going to build muscle because you're not adapting to a new stressor. You've, you've adapted to that level of stress, and so your body doesn't need to change anymore. Stress can increase performance. So if you look at professional-level athletes who set world records, on days of competition, on like their biggest days. Footballers, it, it could be like a, a, the final of a competition and it's a penalty shootout. That level of stress there is ridiculous, but it will increase, it can increase their focus, increase their ability to perform better in that situation. It's also obviously a survival response. It's an internal warning system for danger. If we didn't have that stress response and you didn't respond to danger, like I was saying about lads not taking cover after being shot at for so long, then it, it opens you up to risk because you're not reacting to danger. So it actually helps keep you safe. Um, there are some studies, not many. I haven't referenced them because I could only find like one um, or two, but they do show that mild to moderate stress, mild to moderate stress may improve recovery and improve your immune system. So the one study I did find was that um, there was a group of patients uh, who'd experienced a small amount of stress prior to going into it for an operation and they were seen to recover from their operation. So post-op, they recovered a lot better and they were, um, they had less like post-op infections and their immune system and their body seemed to recover a lot quicker from the operation due to them dealing with a, a small, a, a mild to moderate stressor prior to their operation. So obviously some stresses are good, but there is the disadvantages of stress. So it can negatively impact your ability to concentrate. If you're stressing about work and you come home and you're trying to watch it on the telly or you're trying to talk to someone else, but all you can think about is that stress that you've dealt with in work, you can't think of anything else because of that stress is so overwhelming in, in your mind. Cause headaches, trouble sleeping, changes in appetite both ways. Um, it can increase appetite and it can also suppress appetite depending on obviously how you react to the stressor. It can create anger. You, the, 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 dependent on the stressor, it can emote a very angry response and it can also be like a stepping stone to anxiety, being repeatedly exposed to various stresses. 
there's an increase in health risks as well. Obviously, having higher blood glucose for a prolonged period of time is going to open you up to things like diabetes. And if your heart is constantly working over time, then you open yourself up to heart disease risk and heart and heart issues. So stress management. This is quite an interesting technique. It's really simple and it's actually really, really effective for immediate, like immediately dealing with a stressful situation to go on to what I'm going to talk about next and how you respond to a stressful situation. So UDTs, um, underwater demolition teams, Navy SEALs, are taught a breathing technique when they're going through Navy SEAL selection. So this is one of the most stressful times for them. They're tied with their hands and their feet together and they're thrown into a swimming pool and they're basically taught to drown. They have to float down to the bottom of like an Olympic depth swimming pool, allow themselves to sink to the bottom, kick off, swim back up to the surface, inhale some air, and then allow themselves to sink. Obviously, if stress takes over, if the panic takes over, then they will drown and they'll be pulled out of the pool and they'll fail. So they're taught a breathing technique to do in stressful situations. Obviously, underwater, this isn't going to work but it would be taught before they actually go into the pool to manage the stress buildup before the actual event. So simply nasal breathing, counting in your head a four second slow inhale, four second exhale, and then allow the natural pause of your breath between both. Repeat that for four to 15 times. Concentrate on nothing but the time of the inhale and the exhale and keep repeating it. And it actually, I mean, Isaac will jump in on this. He's actually taking me through some breathing stuff at the moment, um, but the effects on it are pretty much instant. Um, I know Isaac's been, uh, he's actually, from some of the breathing techniques he's using at the moment, has actually managed to lower his rest and heart rate, um, which is sick. <laughs> I have, I have. So literally, I think it go it goes back to what you were saying at the start with sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation. When we're trying to reduce stress, we want to promote parasympathetic stimulation. And by breathing slowly, that you literally are stimulating parasympathetic, the, the parasympathetic nervous system. So in those times of stress, just literally by slowing your breathing down, you are literally, quite literally reducing the stress response and as you said, then like one time I got my, my rest and my, my heart rate went down to like 30 something, which is unheard of because I don't do cardio, <laughs> but it, I got it down to like 30 something simply by breathing really slowly um, as I was going to bed and the best sleep of my life. But I think, yeah, obviously the, the breathing stuff that we're doing at the minute and I'm doing and that I'm getting used to do. Is, is obviously a little bit of a different goal. We're trying to increase aerobic capacity, but it does come into actually promoting a parasympathetic state as well, because that, that is part of it. Um, yeah, cheers, that means. Um Just jump on to the next bit. There's two slides left, and then Isaac's going to jump in on sleep. Um, so what can we do to manage stress, reduce the impacts of stresses? So as I've just spoken about, be it developing the ability to be able to respond to a stressor rather than reacting to a stressor. So the difference between responding and reacting, reacting is that quick, right, shit, what do I need to do? Do it now. Whereas the response is more controlled. You're taking time to think. There's the forethought of how to react. So rather than having that initial stressful moment and just going hell for leather straight in and reacting to it putting something in like the breathing technique slowing yourself down slowing down the stress responses trying to switch back into that parasympathetic state that restful state where you are more able to think clearly and then making decisions to do with the situation that's happened 
there's various relaxation techniques that can help manage um, stress. So things like yoga, meditation, the breathing techniques we spoke about, and even just music, just like sitting there, going somewhere quiet and just slowing yourself down, putting some music on, just relaxing and trying to switch your brain off. Exercise regularly. Exercise have a massive has a massive impact on managing stress. It can help regulate your cortisol levels, which obviously are a big part of the long-term responses to stress. Eating a healthy, well-balanced diet. Everyone knows if you eat shit, you feel like shit. It's as simple as that. If you're already dealing with stress, you've got increased blood glucose levels, you've got increased cortisol, your digestion's not the best. If you then go and stick a load of food in your body, that you would have trouble digesting anyway to then go and consume it when your digestive system is already impacted, then it's just compounding the, the negative things. Um, preparation for stressful events. So obviously not all stressful events can be prepared for. However, if we go back to the list of the 43 stresses, there are some that you can preempt. So deadlines at work, planning, knowing ahead of time that you've got that deadline and not leaving it to last minute to get things done. If you know you're going on holiday, again, not leaving things to last minute and just putting plans in place to better deal with whatever the event is, is going to help you manage that stressful event a lot better than just going in and just trying to deal with it there and then. So this is one from Steve Jobs on how he was so productive and how he didn't let stress overcome him by basically learning to say no. He said he said no to about 90% of the good ideas that came across his table because he only focused on the one thing that he was doing at the moment. If you're constantly saying yes to everyone, yeah, I'll look after the kids, yeah, I'll do this, yeah, I'll do that, yeah, I'll do that bit of work, yeah, I'll do this extra bit of work, you're adding new stresses to that list. If you think back to the score, every new stressor you add, positive or negative, is adding to that that stressor score and increasing your overall score and making you more and more likely to develop um, stress-related health issues. So learning to say no is a massive one. And learning to learn on what your level of ability is to deal with stress and the things that you're currently dealing with and not adding more things to your plate when you're already at like you're already at that point of overwhelm. Avoiding drugs and alcohol and, and compulsive behaviors, obviously drugs, alcohol, getting that down it, everyone knows when they've been out on the weekend, they've had a drink, you wake up on Sunday. And you go and have a little conversation in your head about all the shit and stupid things that you've ever done your whole entire life and you feel really sorry for yourself. If you're already feeling stressed and then you get into that mindset, it's just, it's a lose-lose every single time. Same again, so compulsive behaviours can be um, stress-related eating. Trying to like eat your feelings. It's never, ever helped anyone. If you are relating it back to like diet and training, if you are trying to lose weight, let's say, you've got a specific goal, a specific physique, you're trying to achieve, something stressful happens and you then stress eat, go to that compulsive behavior, it's only then going to one. It's not, it's not relieved the stressful issue and it's also moved you further away from the goal that you're trying to achieve, which is then going to increase, which is then going to create another negative response. So you're going to feel even worse. Social support's a massive one. Friends, family, being social, trying not to shut off from them, but trying to shut off from the stressors. So if there's a work-related stress, just having your head in the work and not speaking to anyone else and not having time set out in your day to sort of switch off and away from it is massively important. Um, I know personally if I will have like a slump in the middle of the day where I'm just not productive. 
so rather than try and like work through it and be productive and keep trying to do work and try and sit there and drive through it, I will just switch off. I'll just go on the PlayStation. I'll just watch a film for like an hour or whatever it is and just completely switch my brain off in that part of the day where I know I'm not productive rather than trying to fight the fact that I'm not productive at that point in the day. Um, so having that switch off is also massively important. If you're still not handling stress well, then go and see professional help. Um, there's a couple of different therapies that can obviously help you deal with stress and compartmentalize stress better than you just trying to handle it on your own. And then finally, which leads us nicely onto Isaac, is improve your sleep. It has a massive impact on your sleep. I'm not going to step into it too much because Isaac's going to go into that now. But improving your sleep is a massive way of helping manage stress. So I'll just stop sharing my screen now and then let you share yours, mate. Sound, sound. <clears throat> So is that is that up properly? Yeah, yeah, mate, that's it. That's all. Sound. So I'm gonna get a little bit nerdy. So if I say anything that you you want me to explain in further detail, then just just put it in the in the chat. I don't think I can see it. I'm not I'm not very good with the Zoom stuff. So Jack, tell me if someone is asking something. Um, yeah, mate, I'll let you know. So these. This is what we're going to cover. Um, so we're going to basically just talk briefly about what sleep actually is, how it impacts your health, and then how that's going to have an impact on body composition. And then just go through a few bits on sleep hygiene and like actually how to, what can you do to make your sleep good and efficient and, and have a high quality of sleep so that you can get, get the most out of it, reduce your stress and get the most out of your training. And then, obviously, we're going to do a Q&A at the end as well. So, what actually is sleep? And I was speaking to, to you, Jack, about this earlier today. Um, a, a really prominent sleep scientist called Matthew Walker has once said that if... It, it, well, he was sort of talking about how, how important sleep is and, and trying to reinforce it. And he said if sleep wasn't so important, it would be the biggest mistake Mother Nature ever made because it would just be completely ridiculous to incapacitate every species upon, upon the earth for pretty much half of, half of their existence unless it was the what most important thing. Um, and another, another of my favourite thing to, again, reinforce how, how much of an effect sleep can have is Lane Norton, if anyone's familiar with him, or Bio Lane. Says it's the greatest performance enhancer other than steroids. Um, so it it's it's massive and uh, a massive area of focus for me. I think um, just actually what what like what what sleep does very briefly. Um, in your brain, as you're going through the day, there's a concoction of chemicals that are firing around and doing things and making you perceive the world and have thoughts and be able to see things and as the, as you go through the day those chemicals get depleted so sleep is a time for those chemicals to re, be rebuilt back up and and then you can wake up fresh with lots of energy and then go ahead and 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 do your do your daily tasks to an, an efficient standard it's when memories are formed so when you go through go through the day and you you experience things the memories that you the memories that you hold have been solidified during sleep and skill learning or skill acquisition comes into that it's like your body will will learn skills it will it will actually while you're dreaming replay the the things that you did during that day so if you're learning to play the piano every sequence that you did that day your brain will be playing it over and over and over again in dream sleep and trying to learn that skill in, in more more detail. It's effectively practicing while you're asleep. Um, protein synthesis and, and growth hormone. Are, so we're going to come into what, what happens with, with your body in a minute, but basically the, the building of muscle effectively happens 
massively while you're asleep. So when we're actually sleeping, we have, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the sleep cycles because they're not, it's not really important, but we basically have two main categories of sleep, non-REM, which is light sleep and REM, which is deep sleep and REM is where we dream. Um, there's obviously different subcategories within them and different stages and each cycle that we go through in the night there is two in each in there's two cycles in non-rem and two cycles in rem each cycle lasts for about 90 minutes and what a good sleep looks like is an efficient transition between cycles and when we wake up we want to come out of a cycle as we're waking up and that's that's what a good sleep looks like we we need to get a balance between quality and quantity so it's not it's not necessarily a good sleep if if you if you get nine hours a night you might have the worst quality sleep ever and it's it, therefore you're not having efficient sleep so we need to get a decent amount of actual time asleep and make sure it's of a good quality so like the very basics, we want at least seven hours. The The scientific literature <clears throat> seems to suggest anything under seven hours starts to have um, effects upon health, which we're going to talk about in a second. If, you seem, if, you be, if you're hitting at least seven hours, it seems to be adequate for most. Um, but obviously it's going to be dependent upon any individual. And I'd say if you feel tired and all the time and you feel low on energy, you probably need to either improve the quantity or the quality of your sleep. We we always say, Jack, as well, like if you're waking up to go to the toilet in the middle of the night, that's not good. It's not a good sign. It means your sleep quality is poor. It means you're not transitioning through sleep cycles efficiently. So we want to be sleeping for at least seven hours and we want to be sleeping right through. So I'm just going to talk briefly about health in general i'm going to talk, talk about cardiovascular health and metabolic health so and this basically a lack of sleep is a stressor to the body so as jack was saying before we have the autonomic nervous system which is um, comprised or subcategorized into sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system the sympathetic nervous system or sympathetic nervous stimulation is when this is what happens when we're being stressed out. So when we have a poor sleep, we see sympathetic nervous stimulation, which is what SNS means just there. So as he said, we, when we're stressed out, we see elevated heart rate. So rest and heart rate there, RHR goes up. We see increased blood pressure. And those two things are directly linked to cardiovascular disease um so simply by getting poor sleep repeatedly and consistently stimulating the sympathetic system you're you're triggering or increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease and just to reinforce how much of an effect it has a little a little fact to blow your heads off the daylight savings time which is the when we lose an hour of sleep basically um, didn't really affect us this time because we were in lockdown, so not not unchanged at all. But normally, when we lose an hour of sleep, that next day is the is the day where we have the highest number of heart attacks across the world in every single country, every single year when we lose that one hour of sleep because those people that were already at risk of cardiovascular disease have now lost an hour of sleep and therefore they're now more sympathetically stimulated and therefore they it just it was it was the straw that broke the camel's back in effect so it just sort of shows how how much of an impact a lack of sleep has and metabolic health so metabolic's a bit of a, a mad word but it's basically just how how the the different chemicals and hormones and and bits and bobs inside your body and your cells work so insulin, I'm, I'm only going to talk about insulin, but insulin resistance is, is really, really bad. 
insulin is basically a hormone, if no one's heard of it, which is responsible for pulling um, food. Once you've digested food and absorbed it into the blood, insulin is what grabs it from the blood and pulls it into the muscle cells or delivers it to where it needs to go. Um, it's really, really important for anabolism and, and body composition and making sure that we're growing muscle and stimulating muscle growth. So there's that. So if you're sympathetically nervous, stimu- nervous, if you're sympathetically stimulated, sorry, your insulin response will go down. So you'll be less anabolic, which we'll come to in a minute. But what will also happen is you become insulin resistant or more insulin you see more insulin resistance which means you can't now control the amount of sugar as well in your blood or you can't control the amount of sugar in your blood as well as you could have if you would have had a good sleep so when we see elevated levels of blood sugar that's obviously really bad your body when i say homeostasis there homeostasis is when your body want your body wants to keep everything at a, a very um, a very constant level throughout the body and any any sort of elevation of blood sugar above a certain point or or below a certain point has massive health consequences so you just have to look at diabetics who if, if a, a diabetic if they go hyperglycemic which means their blood sugar has gone too high they well if they don't get seen to they will die so it's obviously just again reinforced how important blood sugar control is and if we're having a bad sleep, being insulin resistant is is obviously not good. And as well as not being able to control your blood sugar, it will also interfere with cells in your liver. It's, it will it will it, basically part of insulin's job is to pull um, carbohydrate stores from your liver and give them to the blood when we need them. When you're insulin resistant, it will interfere with that process and it will produce the worst type of cholesterol called v vldl cholesterol which is very low density lipoprotein cholesterol so that is what's going to massively massively contribute to poor cardiovascular health and that then again will tie back into the first point about how how um, important how, how much of an impact that has on cardiovascular health as well. So when we have high levels of cholesterol, you, you're more likely to see to see um, heart attacks and, and strokes and stuff like that. So basically, if you want to know, die of a heart attack, get to bed. But also, if you want to be jacked, go to bed too. So we'll talk about body composition. Like, let's actually define what improved body composition is first. And simply, what we're trying to do in, in most cases is create less fat and more muscle. And you will therefore look better. So that that definition, we'll stick with that. Ooh, going backwards. So I'm going to talk about how it, how it impacts um, the, the less fat part of that. So ghrelin is a hormone which is responsible for hunger. And leptin is a hormone which is responsible for making you feel full once you've eaten. When you have a bad sleep, ghrelin goes up so you're hungrier and leptin goes down so you're less full off the food that you do eat. And then obviously we see increased insulin resistance. So the increased hunger and the decreased satiety means you want to eat more food because obviously, um, and then with greater levels of insulin resistance, that that's just the recipe recipe for disaster because now you're eating more food and you've got even less of an ability to deal with it because you've got less insulin. So you're basically asking to fuck your physiology up if you're um, not getting a great sleep. But the main thing I want to focus on is you're going to be more hungry and you're going to be less full um, with with poor sleep. So if you're trying to eat in a calorie, I mean, it's not going to have too much of an impact, that specific part on someone who's who's in a gaining phase or trying to gain tissue when they're eating lots of food. 
but if you're in a calorie deficit and you're trying to diet and you're trying to lose weight you need you're, you're going to be hungry anyway so by getting less sleep and then compounding the hunger and then compounding it again with even less satiety is, is you're just asking yourself to fail in terms of muscle mass so testosterone is probably the biggest um, hormonal or metabolic influencer um, not considering what you're doing inside the gym or what you're doing externally to your body to stimulate muscle growth like testosterone is probably the biggest thing that's going to impact how much tissue you can put on or how much muscle you can grow again Matthew Walker said on the Joe Rogan podcast which is a great podcast I'd actually go and tell you to go and watch that the Matthew Walker episode he's talking all about sleep it's very interesting but he said on that men who sleep five to six hours a night will have a level of testosterone which is that of someone 10 years their senior so obviously we see as as we get older I think don't know if this is true or not but I heard it one time I think as we get to about 25 and onwards levels of testosterone go down and then obviously as we get older and older and older we see muscle wastage and muscle atrophy because testosterone levels have decreased to such a point where we can't sustain that muscle so if you're getting low amounts of sleep and your testosterone is going down that means you're you've got a much much less of an ability to add muscle tissue to your frame so regardless of how hard you're training if you had more testosterone you would put more muscle on regardless Obviously, just ask all the juice heads. So, again, just to just to reinforce, like how does that actually impact your body? So, if you have more ghrelin and less leptin, you're more hungry, less satisfied, so you have a difficulty achieving a calorie deficit. So that means most likely it's gonna it's gonna lead to more fat, and with a reduced level of testosterone. That means less muscle. So what we're actually doing by having poor sleep is exactly what we don't want to do. We said at the start we wanted less fat and more muscle, but we're actually, with the poor sleep, setting ourselves up to achieve more fat and less muscle, which is just obviously what we don't want. A few studies for you, if anyone's interested in going to read them. Khatib et al, 2017, it was a, a review. They basically took um, a load of studies where people were partially sleep deprived and they basically measured, well, partially sleep deprived and then had another group which were just sleeping as normal. And it was pretty much the same across all, all of the studies that they reviewed. They, me they measured the difference in energy intake, which is the f amount of food that those people consumed and on average, the people who were only partially sleep deprived, like not even fully sleep deprived, they ate on average 385 calories extra a day than the group that were not sleep deprived. And that was all relative, obviously. The, the statistical tests worked that I was obviously like for, for the individual because obviously different people are going to need different amounts of foods daily. Um, and most of those calories were what came from saturated fat which which is the type of fat that we we want to reduce the most because it's going to have the the greatest um, negative impact on cardiovascular health and just health in general so again we can we can see now like actual empirical evidence like it's not just oh you have you feel more hungry but you can just fight it like just on average like the people eat lots more food um Yamashita this was in rodents but obviously it still applies to humans I just couldn't find the human study that I actually had access to 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 um reference there's loads of abstracts but I actually was able to read this one because they make you pay like 300 quid to read one study which is annoying but anyway they basically completely sleep deprived um rats or one group of rats or rodents or mice or something and for 96 hours and one group were just slept as normal they seen lower testosterone 
higher cortisol and that triggered that that basically resulted in massively reduced muscle mass or the cross-sectional area they they did a muscle biopsy of one muscle in particular and the the area of muscle so therefore the muscle mass was was massively reduced um, and it goes back to what Jack was saying at the start, like cortisol is, is a stress response. So when we are sleeping poorly, we see cortisol go up and there's, there's mechanisms then which trigger testosterone to come down and we become less anabolic or less in a, in a state where we're building muscle and more catabolic, which is where we're basically breaking down muscle tissue. So... That's why you should sleep and now how to actually optimize your sleep. So circadian rhythm is, is a big massive word or a big massive phrase and it sounds dead complicated, but it's not. It's basically your body clock. Um, but it's more than just your what time you go to bed and what time you wake up. It, it's basically everything. So if you... If you are flying in your face, if you, um, in fact, we'll talk about that in a minute. Your, your circadian rhythm dictates hormonal regulation throughout the day. So hormones are secreted in a specific order at a certain time. And that's down to your circadian health and what your circadian rhythm is saying. And if your biological clock or your body clock is out of sync everything has it has a knock-on effect on everything so hormone secretion is wrong your neurochemistry works wrong which is the chemicals in your brain everything doesn't work efficiently and obviously we need that for, for optimal health so things we can do to manipulate and make sure that your circadian rhythm is prop is properly set up so that you can get efficient sleep and go to bed on time and make sure that everything in your body is working correctly. Um, we can regulate, we can utilize or manipulate, sorry, it's a better word, light, food and temperature. Um, I think what people forget is that our whole biology is is dependent upon the light dark cycle so i think the regulation of the circadian rhythm is absolutely underestimated so we'll talk about light first so me and jack have just massively got into watching the sunrise and sunset now that we have all this free time if you can expose your skin and your eyes to the light at sunrise and sunset, it, it will help regulate your circadian rhythm or your body clock. So the profile of colors at these times is different than it is throughout the day. So at sunrise before 9 a.m., the, the change in light from dark blue to pink to orange to then white light or just normal light, um, that will, that, that there's, receptors in your eyes and on your skin which will take in take in that light and that will trigger responses so hormonal responses will will be triggered in the correct sequence and in, in the correct order and that is then obviously very important and energy levels will be will be regulated correctly throughout the day a little side note which is sort of not really related to sleep or stress but it will impact your energy levels throughout the day there's phone use in the morning so i like to call it panoramic view i don't know what it's actually called but when i'm i'm, I'm trying I'm going to try and explain what panoramic view is it's basically when you're not focusing on one specific thing and you're sort of taking in the whole of everything so you sort of zoom out a little or zone out and you're not focusing on one specific thing or normal view is when you're actually like looking at your phone and you're specifically staring at one one thing on your screen and you're focusing. And panoramic view is where you basically take that focus away. What I spoke about before, the neurochemical regeneration. So when you wake up, your brain is is coming up with that concoction of chemicals and it's not yet ready to produce to, to produce an ability to focus on one thing. So 
it's it's still it's it's re it's it's booting itself up effectively it's like a computer from 2000 that needs it needs half an hour to to try and to try and come up with the concoction to get you ready to to go into the day if you put your phone away and don't go on it for the first half hour you'll notice that you actually don't focus on anything so even when you're um going down the stairs or making a coffee you actually won't folk your eyes will not focus on what you're doing you'll just be in, in in panoramic view um and what you're doing if you go on your phone and start focusing on things on the tv as soon as you wake up you're basically depleting those chemicals before they've even got ready to be used so your energy levels are gonna gonna have it's gonna have a knock-on effect on your energy levels throughout the day so if you want to optimize your sleep get outside before 9 a.m look at the light but don't actually don't actually look at the sun you might blind yourself but like expose your eyes and your skin to the light and don't go on your phone and immediately i'd say though if you're if, you, if you'd feel like you're massively stressed out by the fact you wouldn't be able to go on your phone then that's probably going to be counterproductive so just weigh that one up yourself um sunset um Again, it's pretty much the reverse of sunrise. We want to expose ourselves to that because that's going to be able to stimulate the sleep hormones that will put you to sleep, basically, and make you get an efficient sleep. So blue light is massive. If anyone hasn't heard of it, blue light is basically, it's not all, it's not literally blue. So it's, artificial light and it's basically the name given to a certain wavelength of light which will inhibit secretion of melatonin which as you can see there is the deep sleep hormone so blue light is massively emitted from artificial devices so things like your computer things like your phone i've got a list in a second um they will directly inhibit your ability to secrete melatonin therefore when we go into a deep sleep cycle we're not able to stay there for the correct amount of time and then that has an effect on the quality and the efficiency that we transition between sleep cycles and obviously then our sleep quality is diminished if we're exposing ourselves to that light and again just uh, sort of something that isn't very sciencey but sort of makes sense like if you're on your phone or watching a thriller before bed or you're watching Tiger King before bed, your brain is not relaxed. It's it's active, it's thinking. And you're now trying to just immediately switch off. It, it won't work and you'll be sat in bed struggling to go to sleep. So just we we, we basically want to reduce the use of artificial devices an artificial light before we go to bed in order to allow ourselves to get a proper sleep so blue light examples are your phone laptop tv even things like your bedroom light or street lights bleeding through your curtains we simply like just want to reduce all of that so your bedroom light is a tough one for people but like if you can get a himalayan salt lamp so one of these bad boys this big p pink rock what that does when you put a bulb inside it it will basically just display wavelengths of light that do not inhibit melatonin um, they also look a bit cool incandescent light bulbs are just light bulbs which will give off again wavelengths of light that don't inhibit sleep or you could simply just get a light dimmer switch and reduce the intensity of the light and that again will will have an impact blue light blockers blue light blocking glasses i haven't actually written it on the slide but you can get glasses and you may have seen me wearing them on instagram because they're so cool in fact yeah here they are i'll just whack them on now this is them if you just bang these on before bed you'll be flying they will simply just remove or filter out or mm, not really the correct word, reduce the the amount of blue light which which goes into your eyes and therefore you will get a slightly better better sleep. However, it's not gonna do everything. So just the main things are 
just try and remove all artificial light. If you're struggling for things to do, if it's normally your bedtime routine to go on your phone and watch TV and whatever, like try and find things that are going to entertain you and take your mind off being bored, but are not using any of devices. So just a few, a few examples, read a book, do, do some sort of stretching or mobility work or housework prepare for tomorrow so if you're going if you've got work the next day obviously not in the situation we're in now but if you're if you maybe you can iron your work uniform or whatever it is like you can use that time rather than sitting on your phone and wasting wasting your life and then also inhibiting your sleep like do something productive and improve your sleep digestion so like like jack was saying before like digestion can be can be a stress if we're given too much work to the digestive system to do so if you are about to go to sleep and you're smashing a big massive meal you're literally asking your body to, to work basically for the next eight hours and if it's doing that, it's not able to specific, to effectively go go through a, a sleep cycle efficiently and have a have a high quality sleep, especially specifically if you're having a high high protein meal with with particularly complex protein. So protein is the most complex macronutrient for your body to digest. So it takes a lot. And sometimes like protein digestion, like if you're having a steak, it's probably going to sit in your, in your stomach for about eight hours. If it's a big one. So if you ha- nailed a steak before bed, that's probably not going to be digested until early hours of the morning. And when you, when we see gastric acid release, which is the thing that is going to start to break down or start to trigger the breakdown of the protein, when we when we see that, we see levels of gastric acid increase. We also see diminished quality of sleep. So eating a big meal before bed isn't ideal. Um, carb backloading, if anyone's ever heard of that, is basically when you eat some simple carbohydrates before bed. So something that's easy to digest, so it's not going to have impact upon, obviously, digestive stress before bed. So it will be digested quickly. It's been suggested that we see increased levels of a hormone called serotonin, which is the precursor of melatonin. So basically what that means is when we eat carbs, we see high levels of serotonin, which then gets turned into melatonin, which is that sleep hormone that I was talking about before. So I haven't found any actual solid evidence on this, but some people say it works for them some people say it doesn't try it see see what you think i i just personally like eating carbs before bed because they taste good and it's like it's probably the time when you're most likely to snack so if you can save some simple carbs for before bed and it doesn't inhibit your sleep then go for it alcohol and marijuana so what the, so so people are massively um, wrong about about these two. So people think that having a bevy or getting stoned before bed helps you go to sleep when it actually does the complete opposite. It will inhibit your ability to sleep. It puts you into more of a sedative state or a sedation rather than a sleep. So although you're passed out and un- not unconscious, but you look like you're asleep, you seem like you're asleep, your brain is not actually um, efficiently or or productively going through sleep cycles. It will be, but just not as, a, as effectively. It's not getting everything that it needs done. What you're doing is blocking REM sleep. So REM sleep is the deep sleep, one of the deep sleep cycles that we spoke about before. Um, so if you're blocking REM sleep, it's massive. That's the one where we dream. And no one actually really knows what why we dream. And like science can't yet explain it, but we know it seems to be very important because this is, again, might blow your head off. There's um, 
Matthew Walker was talking about severe alcoholism and delirium tremors. So when people are massively addicted to alcohol and then they come off alcohol or they go to rehab and can't drink, they they have been blocking REM sleep for so long and the build up of that need to have REM sleep has been building up for so long because your body sees it as such an important thing. It can't let it go. It's trying to build it up. Like if it can't get it, it's, it's, it's saving it for another time when it can get it. When you stop drinking or when an alcoholic stops drinking, all that REM sleep build up or the need for that REM sleep, it, it basically just comes through as it, all at once. So when people stop drinking or stop smoking weed, they will have crazy dreams for about a month. And in severe cases, people's REM sleep will just bleed through into their actual conscious, wakeful state. So people will just be walking down the street and just see mad shit and hallucinate because it's REM sleep and dream states coming through while they're actually conscious because the need for that REM sleep is so great and they've been blocking it for so long. So don't, don't get get pissed and stoned in an aid to to try and improve your sleep. By all means, just do whatever you want in your spare time, but don't do it to improve your sleep. Temperature. So we want to keep it cool. Um, keeping it cool is basically, in fact, I'll, we'll we'll talk about that in a second. But simple ways to reduce the temperature in your room: open the bedroom window. These two are a little bit counterproductive or counterintuitive. Get a warm shower. So what happens when you get a warm shower is your body will receive information that you're in a really hot situation and it will try and lose heat. So you'll start sweating. Veins will come to the top. Your hairs will go flat and you'll be trying to lose as much heat as you can. And then when you step out the shower and you're in a normal room temperature again, your body is still expelling all this heat. So your core body temperature actually drops after you get a warm shower. So if you do it not hot, get a warm shower and then just jump out. Have your room cooler by opening the bedroom window. So when you step into the room after the warm shower, you're pretty cold. And then we want to wear socks. And I don't quite understand this, but the, the, the literature seems to suggest that like having warmer fingers and, I mean, it would be ideal to wear gloves, but that's a bit weird to go to sleep with gloves on. But if you wear socks, um, keeping the hands and feet warm seem to mean that we lose more heat from the core, the core body, um, and therefore we, we lose a greater amount of actual body temperature, if that, if that makes sense. And the reason we want to reduce our core, our, our core body temperature is simply when we're evolved to basically recognize a drop in, in temperature and go to sleep. So when we're in in the wild, when it gets to nighttime, the temperature goes down, our core body temperature drops alongside that. And then when that happens, we there's mechanisms at play which will, will trigger, um, a, trigger a sleepy state. Um, Right there, let me go back one. Breathing quickly. So I spoke about when I first started, slow breathing will directly um, stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the one we want to be in to reduce the stress response. So again, that ties back into body composition. When we're reducing the stress response, we're reducing cortisol. We're seeing more of an anabolic state if we've got lower levels of cortisol. So by slowing your breathing before bed however you want to do it i like meditating i've done yoga and a few times and like if you want some sort of ways to find out how to do those then just ask us in a minute on the q a but a little bit it's, it's it's quite hippie some hippie shit so if you're not into that just simply focus on slowing your breathing down just feel how your breath feels as you slow it down focusing massively on the exhalation or the breathing out aspect of it to, to really um, promote that parasympathetic nervous stimulation. So that would be my guide on getting some good sleep. 
Do you want to jump in, Jack? Have we got got any questions? I'm back in. Yeah, uh, Tom Avril, any questions from either of us on anything, even if it's not to do with what we're on tonight? Um, I've got one for caffeine. Like, do you know caffeine before bed? What's your take on that? Because like sometimes I feel like if I have like a cup of tea or something, like I feel like that puts me asleep, even though it should be doing the total opposite effect. Yeah. See, I am. Um... Some, do you drink caffeine a lot? Not really, no. I'm, I don't really, I don't have energy drinks or not. I don't have like any fizzy drinks or nothing like that. Like all I have is a cup of tea in the morning, a cup of tea in the night. Yeah, see, some. I was gonna say sometimes I've got to the point where I've been nailing so much caffeine that it starts to make me tired after I drink it. But I think in in that sense, like obviously we know caffeine does not make you tired. Caffeine is obviously a stimulant, and I think obviously in in the case where you feel that having a cup of tea makes you sleepy it's more likely to be the fact that you've that it's, it's more of a habitual thing you're having a nice hot drink before you go to bed and it's putting you into that routine where right it's, it's time for bed now it's it's that comforting sort of thing a hot drink before bed is probably what's actually making you feel more sleepy rather than uh, a cup of tea if you were to go and have a horlicks or a hot chocolate you'd probably see the same thing yeah, we, we obviously we know that with the caffeine is it directly, uh, it literally stimulates just the opposite yeah. of the what it's doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. But I think if you if you feel like like caff- like it, it it's helping you get to sleep, I'd probably just switch your switch your hot drink around see if that has an effect. But if you're, it's it's definitely not going to be productive for for a good sleep. Because I think the the half life for caffeine is like eight hours, isn't it? Something, Jack. Yeah, I caffeine cut off needs to be about two o'clock in the day. Yeah, yeah. So like nine, ten o'clock um, for the half life to have dropped enough for you to for it to not impact your sleep. Yeah, because there's there's something called is it AM AMP or CAM or so, AM? AM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blocks the thingy receptors in your yeah. brain. Um, so, there's basically a build-up of this chemical called AMP. Like, if that's wrong, it might be wrong. I'm not too sure. There's a build-up of that, which is what makes you actually go to sleep or makes you want to fall asleep. After, I remember it's the Krebs cycle. It basically inhibits the Krebs cycle. Does it? Yeah. So when... Uh, oh, I'm going in. I'm going to pull them straight back to the fucking... That's a big cycle, that. PTT <laughs> days trying to remember the Krebs cycle now. <laughs> When um, creatine phosphate breaks off and you've got the creatine diphosphate with the two molecules yep. and then you have the single molecule floating around trying to connect back to the creatine diphosphate. Yeah. Yeah, something like AMP or something's produced. Oh, no, 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 no. It's ADP. No, I know. You're right, yeah. You've just reminded me because I made the same mistake as you. That's not... A, that ADP, it's got a different role. So, like, obviously, ATP and ADP are involved in obviously energy production. Yeah. But ADP, in terms of the buildup of it for sleep, is completely unrelated. No, no, no. So basically, what happens is because the caffeine acts as like a blocker for the receptor to recreate ATP. When yeah. the caffeine finally wears off, you've got a massive buildup of un- unformed ATP. Yeah. Because there's that massive build-up, it then, that's when you get that, like, caffeine crash or you feel, like, fatigued at the end of the day because... It's done up the energy. It's not had a chance to replenish properly as effectively as it would. So then there's, like, a backload of ATP that needs replenishing. Yeah. So that that, that could be what is, is causing the the feeling of... It could just be a, a really quick caffeine crash that you're experiencing, Tom. Yeah. Cause don't don't drink enough of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually go and research that. Yeah, I need to look back into that because I can't have to remember it. I put rat on the spot there when I couldn't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to ask you some questions. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Have you got any more? Um, I've made the notes on some, but no, I did. I did actually find that fact quite interesting now about the um, the what's it called the less the less one hour in bed, seeing like the greatest 
deaths from cardiovascular disease. Mental, that in it. My head. That baffled my head. <laughs> I was like, what? That's my. You, like people, you, you wouldn't expect such a, a little insignificant thing to have such a huge effect on on cardiovascular health, would you? I know that blew my mind. It's fucking mental. Oh, that's what that's what else I've got actually. Do you know the not going to toilet like throughout the throughout the night? Yeah. How do you combat that in like so like say if you have a drink of water or something before bed, is that yeah. just like a no as well? Just like try and get your fluids in earlier. Yeah, I think we were talking well, about this the other day, weren't we, with that? Um the mm. guy I was speaking about who struggles with it. Um and it I think a lot of the time it does just come down to the fact that you're just not in a deep enough sleep. Yeah. Yeah. If you can optimise your, your sleep quality, you probably, unless you're drinking like fuckloads before bed, you're probably not going to need to wake up. But, I mean, it's not going to help, is it? Having a drink right before bed. So I'd probably just say, try and get your fluids in a little bit earlier, cut it off anyway, if that's something that is that you are waking up to do, to, have a, to go to the toilet. Just... Cut, cut your fluids off a little bit earlier, maybe an hour or so before bed, and then just do everything we just spoke about to make sure your sleep's optimised, to make sure that if you do need the first, you, you stay asleep anyway. Yeah. Because you, you will be able to hold it. Unless you're a six-year-old child. <laughs> <laughs> anything, um, anything from you, Avril? Any questions at all? No. Okay. Uh, round it up there. Thanks. Um, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Isaac, for that. Um, absolute nerd on sleep, and that's why I asked you to come in tonight for me. Um, thanks, Tom, for your questions as well. Yeah. No worries. Nice one for the for the webinar. You're welcome, son. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of your night. I'll see you all again soon. See you soon. See you later. Yeah.